Thank you, Angela, for that prayer, and thank you, Catherine, for reading our passage this morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael. I'm one of the pastors here at Cornerstone, and it is my privilege to get to dive into the message today. For those of you that are wondering, yes, I am sick. Yes, my voice is a little lower than normal. I yesterday had no voice at all, so this is a lot better than that. And we might be a little shorter than normal because I'm going to try and keep my voice for the entire message. But I am excited to get to dive in with you all today, despite the fact that maybe I'm not feeling the best. Because as we gather together in worship and as we gather together as a community, um, I can't help but be grateful. I love getting to be here. So this weekend is Pentecost Sunday. Happy Pentecost Sunday, everyone. We're not going to be talking about Pentecost, but I did want to mention that it is Pentecost Sunday. It is also a long weekend. We also had our youth all-nighter on Friday night, so I stayed up all night with a bunch of young students, and they maybe have more energy than I do, and that's fine, but I just wanted to give a huge shout-out to our leaders. We had a bunch of volunteers come and stay up all night to hang out with students and spend time with them, and that is kind of amazing to me that people would volunteer their time to stay up for 24 hours just to hang out with students. So thank you to those of you that gave up your time this weekend for that. But I am excited to get to dive into the passage today. So Catherine read it. There's a lot of greetings in there. There's a lot of say hello to this person. Here's my travel plans, all of those things. And it's easy to think that this is not something that we really need to pull stuff from. Right? Paul's just talking to his friends, letting us know some stuff, move on. But I think there's amazing stuff here in this passage. And so before I dive in, I do want to recap where we've been. Because in case you didn't realize, this is the last message we have in 1 Corinthians before we move on to a new series. And we've been in 1 Corinthians since September. We've spent a lot of time within this book. We've taken breaks at Advent and different things. But we have spent the majority of this school year looking at this book and what it has for us. And in the same way that Paul, in his final chapter, recaps some of the things and tries to get the people to remember what he said, I think it's important that we remember what we've learned during this passage. So we've talked about things like wisdom and the fact that we need to pursue godly wisdom, not human wisdom, and that that wisdom is the folly of those that don't believe in Jesus. That if we want to actually live this life that we're called to, we need to pursue God and pursue Christ. And if we do that, we will find unity and we will find the ability to work together. We've spent a lot of time talking about the fact that the Corinthian church was divided. They spent a lot of time disagreeing over a lot of different things, and Paul is calling them back to unity. He's calling them to this idea that we need to live faithfully as faithful stewards, as wise builders that we need to put Christ at the center of all that we do, and we can't let the minor divide us, but stay unified under who Christ is. We talked a lot about sin and church discipline and the fact that in Corinth, there was a lot of things they were doing that didn't line up with the gospel, and so Paul says, as the church, we need to call each other back. We need to discipline one another when we are falling away, and we need to live differently than the world around us. If we don't live differently than the world around us, what is the point? Paul wants us to know that we are supposed to proclaim who Jesus is through our lives. And if we are living just like the world around us, we lose our ability to witness. We talked quite a few weeks about spiritual gifts, about the fact that we should pursue the gifts. We should pursue not just the ones that maybe make us feel more important, but that all the gifts are equal, that all the gifts are things we should want. But above all of that, we need to pursue love. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 talks about. We talked about the need to proclaim the gospel, that if we are going to be the church, we need to be people that proclaim who Jesus is to the world. And if we're just worried about ourselves and we're just worried about our own little group, we miss the point of what it means to be the church, and so we need to proclaim the gospel to the world around us. We need to avoid idolatry. We need to avoid the things that hinder our proclamation and pursue Christ. We talked about some difficult topics. We talked about sexuality. We talked about sin. We talked about women in leadership. And in all of these things, we focused on what did Paul tell the Corinthians? What does God want us to know? And how do we live our lives as the church? 
How are we supposed to follow through on what Paul is saying? How are we supposed to apply these things to our lives and how are we supposed to live it out? And so here, in the final 24 verses in chapter 16, Paul is doing the same thing I just did. He's tying together the threads of his letter and he's trying to make it so the Corinthian church remembers what he has said. He leaves little notes so that they don't forget things even as he talks about his travel plans, even as he greets different people, even as he does all of these things, he's making them remember what he's already said. And sometimes we miss this when we look at the last chapter of a letter because there is a lot of greetings. There is a lot of people that we don't know how to pronounce their names. We don't understand why Paul's singling them out. And that's because we live in this age of immediate connection. We have text. We have phone call, we have FaceTime, we have Skype, we have email, we have social media. It is so easy in our world to know what's going on, including with people that live super far away. Take, for example, my sister. My sister and her family live in Perth, Australia. That is about as far away from Saskatoon as you can get in the world. I actually Googled this. It is 15,928 kilometers away. That's where my sister lives. It is the farthest city from Saskatoon that is over a million people. You couldn't get a farther city. And yet, because of technology, we stay in touch. I know what's happening with her kids. I know what's going on with her husband, what's going on with their jobs, what, what they are doing, when they're going to come visit. We have planes we can go. I went this summer and visited her. She's coming next Christmas to come visit us. And we somehow stay pretty connected. My kids know their cousins, despite the fact that we live on opposite sides of the world. But in Paul's day, that wasn't the case. And so the only way for him to show that he genuinely cared about these people was to send them letters. And the only thing he could do to make sure that they knew what he wanted them to know was to put it in that letter. And that's why as he sends off his greetings at the end of this, he's not just using this information without any intentionality. He wants to close off his letter, making sure they know what he wants them to know. And that's because if you genuinely didn't know when you would see somebody you cared about again, the question becomes, what do you hope they remember? So if you didn't have text, if you didn't have your phone, if you didn't have email, if you didn't have the ability to hop on a plane and visit, if you had somebody you loved and you had no idea when you might possibly get to talk to them again, what would you hope they knew? And Paul's language here in the last few verses shows us that he wants them to know what the gospel is. He wants them to know that everything he has said is about how they're supposed to live their lives to lead people closer to Jesus. Paul, in these verses, shows genuine care and love for these people. He wants them to know how much he wishes he could visit them, but yet he doesn't know when that might be. And so he recaps the things he said, and then he gives them one final exhortation, just like we did. We just recapped some of the things we've learned over the last nine months, and now we're going to look at what his final exhortation is. But as a quick aside... The first four verses of 1 Corinthians 16 aren't part of his closing. They're actually the end of his body of his message. And that's because we know that he's responding again to a question they had. He says, in regards to what you asked about the collection, here's my commands. And this isn't something that we should take as prescriptive on how we're supposed to share our wealth with one another. We aren't supposed to take it as prescriptive on how we should tithe because Paul isn't talking about the tithe here. He's talking about a specific collection, collection for the poor. But I think there are some really helpful things that we can learn about generosity and about giving because what Paul lays out here is this purposeful, consistent, proportional approach. He's saying being intentional about setting aside money, money regularly. This is actually the first time we see them single out Sunday as an important day in the church interestingly enough. And so he's saying on the first day of the week, on Sunday, set aside some money and do it consistently. Do it with purpose. Do it because you know it's the right thing to do. And do it proportionally. If you're having a bad week and you have no money, take that into account. This isn't supposed to be a legalistic approach to giving. 
but it is supposed to remind us that our heart is supposed to be one where we want to help those in need, and so we should think about how we can do that in our lives. Again, not a tithe, but how are we helping those in need? How are we giving to those that have less than us? How are we being intentional and purposeful and consistent in our giving? And so that's the last thing Paul says to respond to their questions, and then we get into his conclusion in verse 5. In verse 5, he starts talking about how he hopes to visit them, and here's his travel plans, and we know from the rest of the New Testament his travel plans don't go the way he hopes, but he wants to communicate that he desires to spend intentional, lengthy time with them because he cares for them. And this can be like something we forget because Paul is pretty harsh throughout this letter. He has a lot of strong words for the Corinthians. He has a lot of things where he is saying, you are wrong, fix this, do that. And yet he loves these people. And he wants to spend not just a short amount of time with them, but a long amount of time. And so he says, I hope to stay there for the winter. And if you remember, Paul was teaching on unity and division a lot in this letter. And so here, even in his travel plans, he finds ways to mention a few things. He talks about how Timothy is going to come. And he tells them, you need to welcome him well. You need to make sure you receive him and listen to him. And that's because Timothy's younger, and Timothy isn't Paul or Apollos, the people that they seem to love the most. And so Paul is reminding them, the message isn't about the messenger. If they are doing the will of God, if they are proclaiming the gospel, you should listen to them. Our ability to hear the words of God aren't supposed to be on hierarchy or age or on who we think is important. It's supposed to be on are they proclaiming the words of God and are we able to follow through and listen to those things. And so that's why I love here in our church. We've now moved to this team approach. Pastors Don, Austin, and myself share regularly and we have other people on our preaching team. And that's because it's not about any one of us. It's not about our personalities. It's not about whose presentation style you like the most. It's about the message. It's about the gospel. It's about who God is, not about who we are. And so we need to realize that if we have favorites, that's not actually a helpful thing. We are supposed to hear the message, the word of God, and allow it to transform our lives. And so Paul tells them, welcome Timothy, listen to him even though he isn't me, even though he isn't Apollos. And then that reminds him, he's like, oh yeah, and Apollos. You've been trying to pit me and Apollos against each other, but know this, I told Apollos to come and he's not willing to. He, do, he doesn't want to right now, he says the time isn't right, he'll come when it's ready, but I want you to know me and Apollos are unified. Me and Apollos work together faithfully. We are co-workers, co-laborers. And so this division thing you have going on, it's your problem, not my problem. And so in these short few verses as Paul proclaims his travel narrative and when he's hoping to visit, he reminds them of a bunch of things he's talked about earlier in the letter. And then now that he thinks they've got those things, he goes into what I think is the heart of his message. Verses 13 and 14 are two short verses with an exhortation for how the Corinthians are supposed to live. And it's an exhortation on how we're supposed to live too. And if you can skip ahead to the slides that have the verses, the slides aren't working for me. But in verses 13 and 14, it says this, Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And do everything with love. In these two short verses, Paul gives us a summary of what it means to live out a life of faith and what it means to share our faith with others. These four commands in verse 13, be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, are military words. They're supposed to have the listener realize that this involves action. It involves doing something. It's not passive. And so we want to look at each of these just shortly, individually, and talk about what they mean. Be on guard. It's the same words as we read throughout the New Testament when it says, be alert, be aware. We don't know when Jesus is coming back, and so be ready. Be ready to give an account no matter what happens. 
no matter when it is, no matter what's going on. It's supposed to remind us that because we don't know when Jesus might return, we have to stay faithful. It's not okay to be passive and think, I'll do that later. Because we don't know how much time we have, and so we need to be on guard or be alert. And then Paula follows that up by saying, stand firm in the faith. It's this idea that if we are being on guard, then we need to remain faithful to the gospel. It con- has this connotation of preserving what we know and sharing it with others. In chapter 15, Paul said this in verses 1 through 4. Let me rem- now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believed something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then the twelve. This message of Jesus what he did on the cross and how he rose again and how it changes everything is what Paul is reminding them to stand firm in. To stand firm in the truth that they know. To stand firm in the reality of the gospel and let it transform your lives. And these words, I think, are supposed to call the reader back to chapter 3 when Paul says that our foundation is supposed to be in Christ. That if we want to have a firm foundation, we need to know who Jesus is. If we want to have this ability to stand on guard, then we need to be rooted in who Jesus is. And so we need to be on guard, be ready to give an account, know that Jesus is coming at any time, know that we might die at any time. And therefore we need to remain faithful. We need to stand firm in the faith. But more than that, we need to be courageous. This word might be translated in your Bibles, acts like men. That's a common way this is translated. But more literally, this, tr- this word means to be made into a man or to be made brave, to be made courageous. It implies this active changing, to go somewhere, to do something. And Paul is challenging them that they need to persevere that they need to be aware that things are not easy and so they need to continue to be made courageous. They continue to find their foundation in Jesus and so that they can then learn to be faithful. They can learn to be brave in the midst of this world that doesn't like the faith, that doesn't like what we're about. And this term is a super common command given to the Israelites. If you go back into the Old Testament, You see the phrase, be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you, over and over again. We see it in Deuteronomy and in Joshua and 2 Samuel and Psalms. And in all of these places, it's this idea that we can have courage, we can be made courageous because God is with us. And the reader would have understood this. This is what Paul is reminding them of, that we need to be alert, we need to be on guard, we need to stand firm in faith. And we can be made courageous because our God does not leave us. He does not forsake us and he is with us. And then he repeats it essentially by saying, be strong. Again, it more literally would be translated, be made strong. It's this idea that something else is helping us do that. And again, that something else is God with us. But Paul puts these commands together. He challenges us that we are meant to live our lives differently than the world around us. We are supposed to be on guard. We're supposed to be firm in the faith. We're supposed to be courageous. We're supposed to be strong. We're supposed to put off the immaturity that causes so much of the problems in Corinth. The divisions, the rivalries, because they're thinking about themselves and focus on who God is, grow up in faith, and then they will be able to live the lives they're supposed to. Paul wants them to remember everything he has said, but he's saying, if you don't do these things, you're not going to be able to do the other things because you're going to be immature. And the beauty of these commands, these strong military commands, is that Paul doesn't leave them separate from anything, from verse 14. Verse 14 follows up these military commands with, 
Do everything in love. And so Paul balances the the strength of what he's just said with the reminder that as Christians, everything we do is about love. That all Christian activity must take place within the sphere of love and putting God and others first. If we don't do that, we have missed the point. These exhortations in verse 13 and 14 speak to an urgency to what Paul is saying. And these two verses hold one another together. I'm going to quote Blomberg when he says this, Love without strength deteriorates into mere sentimentality, but strength without love risks becoming tyrannical. It's this reality that we can't do one without the other. Paul wants them to be brave, to be strong, to be, remain steadfast, but he doesn't want them to lose love because otherwise it fails. It becomes tyranny. And it would love without those other things becomes sentimentality. Here in two short verses, Paul has summarized pretty much everything he has talked about in the letter. All of the commands, all of the challenges, all of the reminders of wisdom, of unity, of remaining faithful, of avoiding sin, all of these things are possible if we remain steadfast, we remain faithful, we pursue love, and we don't fall into individuality. We need to pursue all of the things Paul tells us to. We need to pursue spiritual gifts. We need to pursue wisdom. We need to pursue unity. We need to pursue the proclamation of the gospel. But if we don't do those things in love, we've missed the point. And so Paul uses the closing of his letter to remind us of this point. As we went through 1 Corinthians, we've seen how we can't just glide through life. The Christian life is not about just getting by. The Christian life isn't about just doing the bare minimum. Paul is saying we have a high standard that we are called to. We must live up to that standard. And the only way we can do that is through Jesus. The only way we can do that is if we remain steadfast in in our faith, steadfast in the gospel, and remember that love is what drives us. Love is what pushes us to be better. Love is the motivating factor, the defining trait of who we are as believers. And if we miss out on love, if we miss out on love, then we don't have the ability to do the rest. And so Paul leaves us with this exhortation. He goes on to a few final greetings reminding the 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 Corinthians of people that are important and says hello to these people, all that stuff. And then we get to the final three verses where he says this. If anyone does not love the Lord, that person is cursed. Our Lord, come. May the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. There's this this moment where he says, now I'm writing in my own hand, and these are the things he chooses to say. And again, he's kind of tying it back into those exhortations, and he's reminding the Corinthians that love of the Lord is the most important thing, and if we don't love God, we are cursed, because we don't know when God is coming back. And this warning is this emotional appeal, it's this question, are you in or are you out? Paul is tying things back to the very beginning of the letter in chapter 1, verse 18, when he says this, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we are being saved, we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. Paul uses his final greeting to remind them that we need to choose. Are we going to choose to pursue God or are we going to choose to avoid abandon God and live under a curse because we don't know when Christ is coming back and that's still true we don't know when Jesus might return and so we are called to live our lives differently and understand that it is the grace of God that allows us to live this way and if the grace of God is with us we have the ability to love the world around us well 
And so Paul, after everything he has said, reminds us of that when he says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Paul's emotional appeal at the end of his letter, the most important thing he wants these people to know when he doesn't know when he might see them again, is that they need to pursue the gospel. They need to pursue faith in Jesus, and they need to live differently, living under the grace of God because we can't do it on our own and we can't do anything to earn it. But then out of that grace, learn to love the world around us and to allow the way we love the world around us to lead people towards Jesus. And so our question today as I close is this. Are we in or are we out? Are we willing to live our lives differently? To be on guard, to stand firm in the faith, to live the way that God is calling us to live, or are we only going to live for ourselves? I want to pray in a moment, but first I want to read to you again verses 13 and 14. But I'm going to read it to you from the message, something I don't normally do. The message is a paraphrase, and it sometimes helps us better understand how we're supposed to apply this to our lives. And this is the way Peterson words verses 13 and 14. He says this, keep your eyes open, hold tight to your convictions, give it all you got, be resolute, and love without stopping. Let us be a people that is defined by the fact that we keep our eyes open, that we hold tight to our convictions and beliefs, that we give it everything we've got, that we stay resolute, and we love without stopping. Let's pray. God, you are so good. I thank you for how much you love us. I thank you that it is because of what you did on the cross, Jesus, that we can have grace to live differently than the world around us, that we can learn what it means to love the world around us because you loved us first. I thank you that Paul gives us these commands and teaches us how we should live, and I pray that we would go into the world this week and live differently. It's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen.